This special discussion here, uh, we were examining what is happening in our country as usual. We have just below a week before the 21st of March, which is basically um, the expiration date for that 90 days um, as was imposed by the Constitution as a result of the no-confidence motion passed on December 21st, 2018. I have with me in studio this evening uh, Ms. Marcia Nadir Sharma, attorney at law, uh, Ms. Hugh Todd, uh, lecturer at the University of Guyana, and of course, Dr. Stanley Paul, uh, a businessman and of course, uh, a political activist for a number of years. Lady, gentlemen, welcome to the program. All right, so the president uh, moments ago addressed the nation earlier today um, with regards to what is happening in our country. Um, and I've been going through this statement, and I, I suspect you guys would have had a chance as well to probably peruse the statement to see what was said. Um, but I want us to start, what is glaring, and this has been a consistent message from the president that has to do with the elections in the shortest possible time. And the heading of, of his um, address basically is credible elections in the shortest possible time. I want to ask two questions. I want to you know, dissect this uh, basically. What exactly the president um, means by saying credible elections? And secondly, what exactly is the shortest possible time? Marcia, you may want to go first. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, realistically, it's a very difficult question to ask for imputing ourselves into the minds of the president to figure out exactly what it is that he wants. Um, if I had to look at the statement the heading, credible elections in the shortest period of time, for me, there should be no question as to what is the shortest period of time. The Constitution is very clear. The shortest period of time that election should have been held or can be held following the 21st of December 2018 is the 21st of March 2019. There's no um, philosophical review required. There's no um, dissecting required. The Constitution is clear. The Constitution has told us what constitutes the shortest period of time. As for um, credible, um, that in itself begs the question, what does the president mean by credible? As far as I know, as, a, as an electorate, every time I cast my vote, I am doing so credibly. So, um, you know, I may have a different perspective, you may have a different perspective as a Stanley. So um, those are my view typically on the question of credible elections, the shortest piece. Uh, Dr. Paul. I have, two, I have two issues with the statement of credible election. The first and foremost, um, the, the determination of a credible election is not within the president's remit. That's a role and function of GCOM. And the second thing, based on what, based on what we know, um, that term is only used to justify the inordinate um, procrastination for setting the date, right? So um, I have those two issues with, with him using the word credible because it's not within his remit. That, that is the role and function of GCOM. To determine the credibility yes, his, of the his remit is merely setting the date and in this unusual circumstances providing the resources um, which Dr. Jagbio I've said repeatedly that the PUP is prepared to lend the support to that end. You. Well, Eddie, I have to agree with my colleagues here. Um, first and foremost, I believe that most of the issues were adequately ventilated uh, within the public domain. And uh, I believe it is time that we need to get on with, with the business of running this country properly. Um, when we speak to the shortest possible time. My understanding would be, and I guess the citizens of Ghana will share the same view, that we look at the various alternatives available to us and we pick one which would yield efficiency and effectiveness at giving, giving the possible alternatives um, so that there is no issue of credibility and reliability. And we've had issues that were offered by the elections commissioners um, on, on either side, uh, but on our side, we have said that we needed to sanitize the list because we've had continuous registration. Um, so 
based on the fact that GCOM is a going concern, it's not a stop and start um, institution. They're continuously updating and upgrading the voters list. So at this point in time, what we need to do is to sanitize the list and move towards um, a date. Um, so what we're seeing right now is just a lot of, um, I should say, a lot of so rhetoric to find a word. Faith, I want to find a rhetoric word. Rhetoric and bad faith utterance it's, designed to justify the inordinate <laughs> delay. I, I it's, understand. It's, 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 it's like building a model I'm, train I'm, track. I'm struggling <laughs> to find a word <laughs> to, to really express how I feel about this situation. Um, but I, I, I guess Danny helped me out. On the second matter, dealing with the credibility of the elections, I think that the people of Ghana understand and have witnessed credible elections over the last uh, 23 years when the PPPC were in government. So we, we know what a credible election should and be like. Um, so we don't need the incumbent, um, their advice on what a credible election should be. Uh, we've, we've, witnessed it, we've witnessed it, we've seen GCOM hold credible elections from 92 throughout the election cycles when the PPPC was in office. So for the incumbent to be dictating to us the whole issue of credible elections is really trying to position a notion in Guyanese minds that there may be some issue with the voters list and we need to have some time to play with. And I, and I believe that that is what they're trying to sell to the Guyanese, that there are issues and we need time. But we don't need time. We, we know that we've had credible elections. And, and we need to rebut that. As a nation, this is not a PPP issue. This is a national issue. Because persons on either side are affected. This is not persons on either side. This is not an issue where it's just a PNC versus a PPP. This is an entire nation. Um, and apart from that, it's not just a national issue. It's a regional issue. Because we have Caricom brothers and sisters looking on. And we should be a leader within Caricom, and we're not setting a good example as one of the founding members of, of, a, of a regional institution. So this goes beyond our national borders. This is sh shedding a very bad light on Guyana as a young democracy, which we've used and we've nurtured consistently. And now we're at a point where everything is falling apart. And it speaks to deterioration of our political system, which is affecting our entire economy. If, uh, yes. uh, if I can add um, to what you and the doc has been saying, by background, yes, for the last 23 years, the Guyanese community knows what credible elections are. And, and that, of course, in context, is against the backdrop. Against the backdrop that prior to 1992, um, one of the the inhibitors for elections or for democracy were rigged elections. Yes. But notwithstanding that, we are coming out of a situation where in November of 2018 we had local government elections that were conducted on the existing list. And at no point in time were any objections made by either party, by commissioners, by civil society. No one made the objection that the list was in need of sanitize, being sanitized. Yes, all things being equal, one or two persons may find that you know someone passed away, uh, but that is what claims and, and objections are for. And that is a constant and continuing process. So you have a situation where you just came out of local government elections. You have a valid list. You have a list that is valid, according to GCOM, to the end of the 30th of April of this year, that they have repeatedly said, I think on two occasions, at least reported in the press, that there is, the list is credible enough to have elections. I think the chief elections officer himself would have um, said that on, on a few occasions, that the list, exactly. nothing is wrong with the list per se. So, uh, since we were examining this, um, the, the other issues surrounding the whole, the whole notion of credible elections in the shortest possible time, um, we're seeing a lot of passing the buck, if you want to call it, where 
Um, the president on one hand is saying, oh, I have to wait on GCOM uh, to be ready, to tell me when they're ready. And GCOM is saying, no, that we have to wait on the president to give us a date. Um, I believe, sorry to cut you, Eddie, but I think according to the president's statement today, there's a third element now, that the National Assembly must advise on when, must advise GCOM as to when the date should be. So and I, I want us to examine that because I think there is there is this 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 um, somehow this conclusion in the minds of many Guyanese, not only in the political sphere but across the country, that all of these are part and parcel of some sort of plan. And I think you you alluded to that plan, and you, Dr. Paul, to some extent, um, the bottom line is delaying the elections. Yes, right. They're hoping, um, they're hoping to delay the elections and, and to buy some time to bribe people. That's what they've been doing. They've been using state resources all over the country to become Mother Teresa. So they come up with all these excuses and putting the buck over to GCOM. And now we know that they're putting it over to Parliament. But the problem, you know, incidentally enough, um, the same characteristic associated with, with President Granger, um, leadership as to how he's treating with this calling the election is the very thing that caused him to be in the problem that he had because... Um, He's not a decisive leader. He don't provide the leadership. He, does, he, you know, he doesn't provide leadership when, when he, he ought to. Because um, not only based on practice, but based on the law, it is he who's supposed to set the date. He's supposed to tell GCOM, look, this is a date I have in mind. What you need to, to, to have it done? And provide all the resources because they keep disregarding the fact that we're operating in unusual circumstances of vote of, of no confidence. It's not normal circumstances where time is not the essence or the issue. This is unusual circumstances where time is of, 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 of the essence. And they totally disregard it. And, it. and Mr. Granger, before this no confidence motion, is a man, I mean, I myself have held in high, high esteem when it comes to integrity and class and all these things. But, you know, the way he treated with this whole thing about calling the election, I, I, you know, it brings his whole credibility and integrity into disrepute. I don't know why you don't take a page from, from Desmond Ike book or something. You know, you should, you know, go to the polls and allow the chip to fall with me. Um, I want to... All right, who's going to... Let, let, you and then uh, yeah, Marcia. Okay, right. no, I want to respond to this briefly as well. I think what the citizens of Ghana need to understand is that what you're seeing now is the underbelly of the, of the PNC. Um, they're they're using the same rule book that was administered during the 28-year rule, which is just based on opportunism and power. Um, they have never developed a model for development, for inclusiveness, um, and for moving the economy forward. They've always depended, depended on some amount of um, leeway that they were, would have been given by the West, and they've, they've basically used that to their, to their advantage. What we're seeing now is a m movement away from what existed during that period, from a bipolar world which was ideologically divided to a, wor of a world that is very multipolar now, with many power brokers and institutions, and the globalization of world politics. So what we're seeing now is, is the same model that they've used, that they've, that they've just brought to bear on this, in this contemporary time. So they're, it's a misfit. So they're using a model that does not suit the environment that we exist in now. And that is why they, it's so problematic for them, because they've not rebranded and restructured their philosophical um, outlook on, on the world itself to see that time and history would have overtaken them, and they are now trapped in a time warp, and it's affecting them badly. Um, and moving, moving beyond that uh, would take a re-engineering of the entire machinery of the PNC, which they will have to figure out. But in the meantime, Ghanaians have to recognize that they are not a responsible political party, and they are hurting the political system of this country. And you need a very healthy political system to move an economy. And, and they have done a disservice to, the, to this country repeatedly. And we're seeing exactly what they've used in the, in, in the 70s and the 80s, they're using now in the, in the 21st century, which is a total misfit. Nice. If I can add, um, from the 
from a legal perspective, there is no provision in the Constitution that actually says that the president shall dissolve parliament or shall, by proclamation, select a date for election, dissolve parliament, subject to the readiness and the capacity or capability of the Guyana Elections Commission to hold credible elections. That's the first thing. No provision in the Constitution. Um, there is nothing that says in any subsidiary legislation that actually says the National Assembly must advise GCOM or that GCOM must advise the president. Now, persons might say, okay, or might argue that you've got to go beyond the, the written word of the law. Now, mm -hmm. our position is that the supreme law of the land is the Constitution. There's no deviating from that. That is the where the buck stops. But notwithstanding having that rule book, one might say, okay, you have grown adults who should be able to sit down and discuss, come to a position, um, because at the end of the day, GCOM can't act, act in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So what would we, the Guyanese electorate, expect to happen following the no confidence motion? What we would expect is that having been aware that there's this no confidence motion, that the, the uh, Secretariat of the Ghana Elections Commission would have said, okay team, we have a no confidence motion that has been passed. The Constitution says we must have elections in 90 days. Um, realistically or not realistically, I cannot have elections in 90 days because of X, Y, and Z. One would expect that GCOM would have had this work work plan already laid out mm -hmm. since maybe the 22nd of December, right? So that expecting a call from the executive saying that, look, we are going to have elections. Tell me what you need. Tell me how you plan to do this. And of course, the executive wouldn't be doing that in isolation. We would expect that reasonable mindedness would say that I would consult the opposition on it as well. So that should have been the first step. Then having establish this work plan and establishing the pros and cons, what I need, what I don't need, you know, a plan of action on how to achieve to get me to elections. Now if, okay, let's say benefits of the doubt, right? All things being equal that um, GCOM genuinely could not deliver elections in 90 days, even though when the Constitution was amended by Bill Number 17 of 2000, it was done on the understanding and when the Commission was established mm -hmm. to be a permanent fixture independent of the legislative and the executive arm, it was on the premise that GCOM must always be in a state of readiness to have elections. That was never um, in dispute. It must, if, if the, the government of the day said, I want elections one month after being elected, GCOM must be ready. So there's no, there's no meandering out of those requirements. But did that happen? None of that has happened. You have now, we're literally at the 11th hour, uh, practically, and um, you now have a request for a work plan. How are we reasonable, rational-minded uh, Guyanese who have to still live on a day-to-day -day basis, who still have to provide for our children, who still have to get up and go to work on a day-to-day -day basis, can truly accept that the government is being genuine when they say they cannot call elections because GCOM is not in a state of readiness. Uh, thank you, Marcia. Thank you, guys. Uh, I, I want to move you to uh, a few other areas because I want us to have a, a little bit of a discussion to dissect what the president would have said in his address to the nation. And I want to I want to talk a little bit about the the him saying the the authority of the legislative branch is unimpaired. Parliament has not been dissolved, um, and I think this is fitting in directly into the narrative of business as usual. Everything is is normal. Um, he's saying that the assembly remains. In session, uh, I would want to go with, with Marcy on this one first. From a legal perspective, um, I know you have some very strong views on this particular issue. Well, no one has actually doubted that the legislative is still intact. That has never been in question or in doubt. And in fact, um, I have a strong view, which I've actually expressed to you, Ed, 
Because, you know, we fail to realize that since the 21st of December 2018, we had one sitting of the National Assembly in January 3rd, right? Third, January yeah. 3rd. Since then, there has been no sitting of the National Assembly. Now, who determines the agenda or who determines when the the assembly is called? Right? You still have three months. You should, if you know that um, the elections being held in 90 days is of in such importance, and GCOM's state of readiness is of such importance, one would think that the government would have submitted an agenda to the National Assembly for the members to be called and to sit and have a discussion. But where's the evidence? None of that has happened. So how can we genuinely, again, believe that there's been any real attempt to overcome what is going to be a constitutional crisis in a matter of less than a week? And I see, um, you. I know you have a, a, a contribution to make here, but I just want to add this bit before you go to say that and um, the president uh, went on to quote even the chief justice to say that the chief justice um, has said in her ruling on the 31st of January that parliament has not been dissolved as a result of the no confidence motion. So that by itself, pulling that quote is a, is a, is a recognition of exactly what you were saying. Well, Eddie, I have to agree with um, Marcia and my contribution to this from an untrained legal mind, I'm trying to look at it as every other Guyanese would look at it, is that the, the, the government is trying to move the goalpost, and they're trying to cherry pick at, at issues or on matters that can give them some amount of breath to, to breathe, uh, or air to breathe, because they've been running out of oxygen, and they're struggling to find um, a hang on. Um, so what they're doing is that they're just scouring the literature and scouring the judgments, etc., looking for a lifeline. Um, but it shows that they're very desperate um, and they're bent on extending their life in office without a mandate. Um, because they recognize that they do not have a mandate to, 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 to govern after the 21st. So they're trying to see where they can find a lifeline and try to appeal to their constituency for them to say, well, okay, yes, we found something. Because what they're depending on is basically the sympathy of their supporters. Um, persons who are on the fence, to put it that way, or who have already decided that I prefer to, to, to cast my vote to the PPPC, would have recognized that the government has run out of options um, and they're now looking for a lifeline to, to hang on to power. Um, and it's a ping pong match between the government and GCOM. Um, the, the unilateral appointment of the chair um, is showing clearly now that there must be some close and personal relationship between the president and the chairman based on how he's managing the, the institution. Um, and this is what we have um, been very, we've been very uneasy about uh, when it comes down to the to, to crunch time, and we have to to lead by example and to ensure that we give good governance. We wouldn't get it now because we've seen that there's a ping pong match between the two, the two, the two headships, and it's a, it's costing us financially. It's costing us in terms of business. Um, the risk of doing business would have gone up. Um, so investors would not be thinking about coming together right now. Those who are here are scared. Um, you can have capital flight. Or I can see persons thinking about a second option in terms of, of, of moving from Guyana. So there's, there's a lot of implications for, 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 for a small and fragile nation that has come through a lot of tragedy and trials and now trying to rebuild, and now we're reversing that trend. Um, so it is a very sad time for us in Guyana um, to go through such a such a such a period when it's really unnecessary. Um, it's an, a vote of no confidence. It was it, it went through. The speaker pronounced in it, the Chief Justice pronounced in it, it's very clear. 
we've argued this and ventilated this well enough in, in, in the Last public moment. domain. So the, the government is just bent on disobeying the wishes of the people of Guyana and it's hurting them. Um, they must know that, but where they, their schooling teaches them to be arrogant, um, it teaches them to be basically a psychological fox. And that's, and that's, a, that's a philosophical, political science concept that speaks to the, the actions of this government. And it's sad that we're in this position when we're supposed to be a champion within the Caribbean community. Well, well, Eddie, I, I, am, I am no lawyer, so I, I wouldn't really um, deal with the legal aspect of as, um, as to whether Parliament is um, dissolved or not and so forth. But what I do know is that um, basic common sense will tell you that if you have a vote of no confidence, it must be some effect. And to disregard the effect is to, in, in isolation, to say that it's null and void. There must be some implications, and the implication is that because of the no confidence motion, Parliament can't operate as business as usual. The only purpose for which it can operate with the support of the opposition is to call election and provide all the, the funding. So for Mr. Green to say that Parliament is not impaired um, is troubling to say the least. But the, the fact that the, the President is placing all this emphasis on Parliament in place and, and so forth, um, the National Assembly is intact and everything, the legislative branch, um, let's put it that correctly, um, shows that somehow he's trying to give the impression that it, there's, there's this great respect for the Constitution and what the legislative, the, the, the separation of power and so on. But the fact of the matter is the legislative branch would have spoken twice. Let us talk a little bit about that. Who's going to go first? Marcy, you want to go first? <laughs> There's a lot of legal, <laughs> legal <laughs> stuff here, so they you want to hear from you, you know, more on the legal side. There's no blueprint. There's no manuscript. There's nothing that can offer the Guyanese community and its leaders a line-by-line -line action plan on how to proceed following the no confidence motion. The no confidence motion was unprecedented. We all we've all agreed on that. I think the the whole society as a whole has talked about the no confidence motion and its impact and what it really means. Um, the reality is the ruling of the Chief Justice, which is being challenged at the Court of Appeal. And let me say uh, at this point that there is nothing prohibiting the government, as they have done, to exercise their legal right to challenge and to question or to seek clarification on the interpretation of the Constitution, given that it has essentially been um, denied the ability to, to rule for five years. Having said that, um, the legislative branch and the executive branch um, of government is or I should say is made, the government branch of the legislative is really made up of the president, the cabinet, and other ministers. And I say that in the context because this, is, this was an issue actually brought up in the legal challenge. Um, 1066 actually says that if the government is defeated, then the cabinet must resign. Now what is the cabinet? And then how, does that, how is that different from the government? Now, Again, remember that there are 27, 27 ministers, yes. 27, 28 ministers. A lot. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> not every member of or every minister sits at the cabinet. So you have the president who is the chair of cabinet, and then you have a small group taken from the larger pool who sit and determine the policies and, and the path and the vision, and I say that in inverted commas, for um, the country. The no confidence motion is passed in accordance with the Constitution. The Chief Justice has ruled that by virtue of the no confidence motion, cabinet is deemed resigned immediately. So does that mean that the government stops, that there's no government? No, that's not what it means. It just means that you cannot operate as business, business as, as usual. usual. 
And, and you don't need a rule book to tell you that. That's common sense. Okay? The, you choosing to ignore the Chief Justice's ruling, ignore the Constitution, and have ministerial plenaries that makes the same decisions and has the same powers as cabinet. a cabinet mm -hmm. cannot be any more glaring a disrespect to the Constitution. And, and that is as simple as it gets. There's no, there's no gray area. It's either you follow the Constitution or you don't. I want to bring you to the, the second point, and um, this has to do with the president talking about the independence of the judiciary. And he's saying the independence of the judiciary, the judicial branch has been respected. Says the, 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 it has been respected, but the chief justice would have ruled to say that the motion was properly passed and cabinet stood resigned on the evening of the 21st of December. Is this, and the government is still going ahead and not respecting uh, the ruling and the, I mean, everything that the, 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 the Lord and Chief Justice would have said basically point you to that you must go to elections. Is this really respect for the, the, the judicial branch? No, it's not. I mean, it's, it's the same point that I just made. The reality is that you have a right to challenge, right? In a democracy, you have a right to challenge. You have a right to go to the court, and you've utilized that right. But the Chief Justice has not granted a stay. So while you are seeking clarification, whether for now or for the future, the reality is tick tock, tick tock. Time is running, and you you cannot expect reasonable, rational-minded guys to say um, we understand and we think that you are justified um, in ignoring the word of the law, and that is the Constitution. And, and to answer that, Eddie, um, what, we, what we're seeing is a government that is very undemocratic. Um, they would use the same democratic machinery to get into power, but once they get into power, then they take off that um, coat and then you see the true, the true identity of, of, the, of the PNC. Um, they've always been undemocratic. Um, they've never pra practiced any good democratic principles and values. Um, they've used it to their advantage when they're in opposition. And they speak about it when they're in opposition. But once they're in power, you get to see the true nature of, of, of the PNC. So what you're seeing exhibited here is shocking to many. Um, but I would, I would believe that most of the senior members on this side, um, they're not surprised um, by the actions of the PNC because this is what they're known for. Um, they're known for being um, in violation of all good democratic principles and values. And, and there's enough literature out there um, for us to, to see the true meaning of what the PNC um, is as a, as a political party. So what you're seeing here in terms of their utterances, um, they're trying to polish it up a bit now because clearly we're in a totally different dispensation globally. So they're trying to see how they can polish it to make it look as if they're democratic. But at the core, basically they're saying to, to the Guyanese people, we really don't care. Um, the Attorney General said it publicly that the Constitution is wrong. <laughs> so he is saying that the framers of the Constitution were really incompetent. They, they should not have crafted the Constitution that way because now that they're in power, and the same Constitution they were depending on in 2015, pre-May, when they were trying to move on the confidence motion, they were depending on the same Constitution to get them into the power to bring the, the PPPC government down. The same Constitution was used by the PPC in opposition this time around, they have fallen, but now they they don't like that because it doesn't suit their interests. And and what people are getting to understand is this. The PNC has never demonstrated to the Guyanese people that they can manage, they can mobilize people, and they can win the hearts and minds of people. 
they've never demonstrated that. Um, and because they've never demonstrated that and they've never used the time in opposition to learn um, how to really win the hearts and minds of people, you're seeing exactly what they have to do to survive. And that is to violate every single thing that is best practice um, and to hang on to power at all costs. I want to bring in uh, Dr. Paul here because I think this is an area that you're very passionate about and you've, you've spoken at length about the, the actions of, of, of the current government. Um, so I'm going to give you a chance to, to speak about, probably to follow up with what you would have uh, mentioned. You see, Mr. Le Pomerlin, you see, the whole talk about respecting the judiciary is really a rhetoric. The fact of the matter is that the, the, the coalition is mortally afraid to face their own people at the polls. So they will come, they're coming up with all these frivolous excuses that can't hold water. I'll give you an example. For instance, Mr. Granger is claiming that the parliament is um, not in pay, but the Chief Justice ruling clearly suggests so. That is not business as usual. Once it is not business as usual, there's some form of impairment. Right? So, for me, I wouldn't even squander any time trying to analyze anything Mr. Granger said. I, I prefer to deal with the fact that they are mortally afraid to go to their own people based on their own misdeeds and the way they have been governing this country, based on spite, wickedness, and vindictiveness, and all these kinds of things, and, and downright bad mind. An example is with sleeping. With sleeping. Sleeping um, invested millions of dollars and were going to create over 300 and something jobs properly high paying jobs and they just crashed that, crashed that, callously crashed it out of envy and spite and vindictiveness. And the same thing with this guy in, in the current, you know who brought in the um, the windmill with the current. Right? He was a pioneer in that respect. They crash it. So I think all those things is, is um, among to them not wanting to go to the pole. So they keep coming up with all these things, and don't be surprised if they come up with more. So, you know, we shouldn't waste and squander any time trying to make sense out of it, because it, 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 didn't, it doesn't come from a mind of sense in the first place. Before you go, Marcy, I want to drop this into the works, and I think this, this is a very interesting piece. Um, and I think I, I, somehow the president was set up to this in his, in his address. So I want to read a part on the, um, the independence of the, judici the judicial branch has been respected. And the president says this, and I quote, the Speaker of the National Assembly was asked to review his decision in light of the legal issues which arose as to the validity of the vote. He declined to reverse his decision. He recommended in his statement, and there was a pull quote now from the Speaker's uh, statement. And it says this, full Final and complete settlement of these issues by a court of competent jurisdiction will place beyond any doubt questions which may exist and serve to give guidance to the Speaker and to the National Assembly for the future. I want to put that into the works because all these excuses about challenging the court that we can't go ahead with the elections because we, we're challenging the decisions and so on. Um, and like I said, the, the president is somehow trying to say that, you know, the, 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 the judicial branch is being respected and, and, and all these things and the, 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 the parliament is being respected, the National Assembly is being respected. But here, clearly the speaker never said to go to the court and try to get somebody to overturn the decision. Go ahead now. <laughs> <laughs> well, not only did um, the speaker not say that, uh, your summary of what you your, or your interpretation of what the speaker is saying. I'm actually looking at what the speaker is saying, and my interpretation would actually be that the speaker himself recognizes that following the no confidence motion, the reality is you have a particular course of action that must be complied with, which is that on the Article 6 to 1 of the Constitution, the President should by doc, um, proclamation dissolve Parliament, appoint a date, and within 90 days you have elections. That must 
happen. At least in the speaker's mind, mm -hmm. I would want that to interpret it that that is what the speaker, yeah. and hence his use of the word future. Because if there is, an, for an abundance of caution, if you have any doubt, then a court of competent jurisdiction can say that, look, maybe we, you didn't do it right this time. Maybe next time this is how you can do it. But having said that, I, I actually want to bring the point in here that, and, and reiterate the point that the court has not stayed the time, has not stopped the clock from ticking. So when her honor made the ruling on the 31st of January, she didn't say, okay, everybody stop, take a time out, and let's go to court. The time continued running. Now, if you wanted to look at whether the government was acting in good faith, one would think, and, and if I'm not mistaken, the president's um, address said that there are four things that run concurrently following the passage of the no confidence motion, which should not alarm us, right? And that being the function of the legislative arm, the executive arm, the, um, the judiciary, and uh, um, the, the ability of GCOM to hold credible elections. And those four things should be running concurrently. Now let's examine the timeline. On the 31st of January, you had historic decision in this country made by the Chief Justice. You had an appeal filed on the 5th, I think it's the 5th or the 10th of February. It was not until, correct me if I'm wrong, the 21st of February, 21 days after uh, correct me, that, that, that the executive even sent yeah. a letter. Is, that, is it the 21st? I think 21st or the 23rd, somewhere around there. Right. So, no, the, the, the letter to invite the, the, the leader of the opposition, that is the one you're talking about? No, no, no. I'm talking about the one to G come to say, tell me um, what you need. It's February, yes. Right, February. Yes. So my point is, where in that timeline was concurrent? One would have thought that, yes, when you file your appeal, you would have written the letter at the same time because you want to make sure that if this thing does not, if this ruling does not go in your favor, and even if you went to the CCG for final, for final decision, you would have been acting concurrently in all branches of government or powers of the country, right? The democratic organs of the country. But there's no evidence to that effect. This again reinforces our, our inability to have faith and trust in what is being asked of us as Guyanese. I, I want to bring you guys to another aspect of the President's um, address because we're trying to get through this as quick as possible. Um, an hour is almost um, through. Uh, the third, one of the third elements of the President's um, address has to do with the competence of the executive branch He's saying that the competence of the executive branch is essential to the viability of the state. And he's quoting um, 1067, which is saying, notwithstanding the defeat, that the, the, the government shall remain in place. And I think you've made the point earlier about the distinction between cabinet and the government. So he's saying, in essence, the, 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 the Constitution contemplates continuity. So, And it's in this basis, I think, he made a statement that the president, I, I remain president until the president, the next president is sworn in. When that is, that's a different issue. But let us, let us deal with this particular aspect of Article 106, um, and this has to do with 106.7, which talk about notwithstanding. Well, 106.6, as um, the public probably knows extensively by now, essentially says um, that uh, the government must resign um, on the passage or on being defeated on a, no, a vote of confidence. 1067 of the Constitution essentially says that notwithstanding being defeated, the government shall remain in place um, and that until the next president is sworn in, then the government is essentially um, replaced or slashed, resigned. But what does that mean? And to understand what that means, you really do have to go back to when the Constitution was amended in 2000. Now, Remember, as part of constitutional reform, you had civil society, politicians, um, a, a, ex the judiciary, an extensive mm -hmm. consultative process where um, 
one or six, six and seven, was actually removed from the original 1980 constitution. It's a point that has been made by um, the government in its legal case. And so in 2000, um, Bill number 17 of 2000 sought to reintroduce the concept of no confidence motion. But if one were to examine the explanatory memorandum at the beginning of that bill, and what is an explanatory memorandum? For anyone, any lay person who wants to understand why a law is being made and why it's going to be debated in Parliament and eventually made law, is the, the explanation or the reasoning and rationale behind the legislation is provided in that explanatory memorandum. So if you examine explanatory memorandum for Bill Number 17 of 2000, you will see a, prov a provision that says that Article 106 is being amended, 106 of the Constitution is being amended to insert subsection 6 and subsection 7. And as it relates to subsection 7, it is meant and it's being placed there so that the government shall remain in place for the purpose of holding elections. It, it's in black and white, for the purpose of holding elections, not for carrying on business as usual, not for pretending it doesn't exist, um, not to say don't worry, everything is okay, um, no need to get in a huff and a puff over the fact that a no confidence motion has been passed. The explanatory memorandum says it, that the reason we are doing this is so that the government, notwithstanding being defeated, the government will be allowed to remain in place for the purposes of holding election. And once those elections have been conducted, then they might very well go back in, or they may lose. But whoever the winner is of those elections will assume government. Do you want to go? Or? I don't think um, anything else needed to be added. I think that was clear as, as, the, as the memorandum which informs legislation. Uh, it's clear that the government will only remain in purpose for the purpose of calling elections and seeing elections is held. And I probably would add that um, for the day-to-day -day normal um, functioning of the country and so forth, but nothing major. So that's what that does you anything I would add to it. Yeah, you And uh, to add to what Marcia would have said, and this is from a political science perspective now, adding to her observation from a legal mind, um, what you're seeing here is an emergence of a dictator. Um, and if the Guyanese uh, people decide or decides to, to give him more space, he'll become a full-blown dictator. And this is how they start, by pushing and prodding, and pushing and prodding. Um, and if we continue to be passive um, and accepting, um, we'll have a full-blown dictatorship in the island. Um, what we can see as being a buffer is that now we have the international community that can come to a rescue. But we have to agitate to get attention as well um, because we have harmony of interests at different levels um, and we have to guard against that as a people. Um, so we will have to agitate to ensure that we don't end up in a full-blown dictatorship because that is what we've seen emerging. And if you sit back and you accept it, then we will be the ones to, to be blamed. We, the citizens of Guyana. And this has to do with the entire citizenry. This is not this is not a PPP or a PNC matter now, because if we end up in a full-blown dictatorship, everyone will, will suffer, all right? Because if you get into that realm, then it's really about elitism, and we'll just be a small group of people lording over the entire society. So if the people on, or supporters of the PNC believe that this is what we want because we need to stay in power, they will be affected, affected. and probably even worse than, than, than other supporters. So we have to come together as a people to protect our democracy and not shield a government that wants to move in that direction because it's going to harm us and we're going to take years to rebuild. We've seen what happened 
after 28 years of dictatorship under the, the last r rule of the PNC, and if we allow that to slip through, we can be badly damaged as a people, and we don't want to go back there. In conclusion, though, I want us to um, quickly maybe look at everything that the president would have said. And um, like one person said to me when I was putting together this program, I tried you know, to get some interpretations and so on, is that it's basically a rehash of all that he's been saying um, since the 21st, well, the 22nd of December, I think he made his first statement, the morning. Um, it's a rehash of the same thing. So it is being described by some as a lot of nothing. I want to hear the views of you um, with regards to what the statement, would have, uh, what the president would have outlined in his statement. Because um, if you look at the very top of the statement, if, if I can just uh, share with you, um, he is basically saying that um, people should not be anxious and alarmed as to what is happening as a result of the no confidence motion and where we are. I, I'm, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Paul to go so we can wrap this up. Well, as I said earlier, um, currently, I refuse to squander my precious time to try to dissect and analyze the president's statement because I know it's really a ploy designed to justify the inordinate delay of calling the election. And I prefer to call upon the PVP supporters in the diaspora, especially those who have resources, so they should start helping us by mobilizing all over the diaspora. Find out all who register, all who are on the list and the living in the diaspora. Make contact with the different airline and so forth. So whenever the president announces the date, provide the support so they will come back home and help us to, to reclaim this country because this election is the mother of all elections. Because we know, based on the coalition track record, that they have no compassion even if you put a trillion US dollars in their hand. Nothing good will come of it. And if you doubt that, they themselves used to send back billions of dollars from the budget. So you're dealing with people who are downright bad man. So I call upon the PAP supporters in the diaspora, especially, time to close ranks and put your shoulder to the wheel and give us all the support that you can give us to let us become victorious whenever the election is called. Marcia. For me, uh, the president's statement uh, whether and as an individual we choose to um, agree with it or disagree with it. The reality is he is the president of the Cooperative Republic of Ghana and the citizens want to hear from their president even if it's repetitive or not um, because hearing from your president or our president essentially gives us a sense of um, understanding that what we consider to be an important matter is being considered or being taken seriously. But notwithstanding that, and that, with the greatest of respect to the office of the president, the realities are that every person will become anxious because they are uncertain as to what will happen after the 21st of March because persons don't know what to expect. That in itself will cause anxiety, whether it be in a husband, whether it would be in a public servant, whether it be in a wife, um, and their children by extension. Because like I've said before, life still goes on for everyone else. Um, their lives, their democratic rights are being um, affected or will be affected if they're not allowed to vote, um, if there's no sense of stability. And without compliance, while the direct compliance or non-compliance of the Constitution does not on a day-to-day -day basis affect a, an individual, the culmination of inaction or inability or lack of will to call elections, face the electorate, stand by a record, or and possibly face defeat, um, or will def you know face defeat, um, does in it have an impact on every single citizen, supporter or non-supporter. And so, for me, I would hope that notwithstanding trying to comfort the Guyanese society by making a statement as His Excellency would have done, I look to the government to take the next step and take the initiative of setting that date for election. Let us deal with this matter once and for all. Well, Earlier, I see this as a 
master-servant relationship. Um, the citizens being the, the master and, and the government being the servant. I think the people of Ghana would have spoken through their representatives in the National Assembly. The government would have fallen and a series of um, events should have occurred that have not occurred. Um, so basically the government is disobeying the will of the people, clearly. That is what we, we, we're seeing. Um, so I think messages from from the head of state is basically to, to bring some sense of calm um, to a, a population that is clearly uneasy. Um, and that level of uncertainty is not good. Um, I can imagine that they're uneasy as well. Um, they're human beings, um, they're not machines. Um, so they are, themselves are uneasy, and they have a society that is uneasy. Um, they have a crisis that is looming. So I'm trying to put a message out there, and you can look at the tenor of that document, you can tell that it's meant to, to bring some sense of calm um, to a society that is, is heating up. Um, but I think what is going to give some sense of relief to the people is to actually call a date for the elections. Um, because people are really holding their breath. Um, and we cannot, we can't survive like this. Um, and for a young democracy, this is not what we should be experiencing. We should be moving seamlessly along that um, trajectory. Um, and what we're seeing now is basically a, a dismantling of all of the institutions that we've worked hard to, to achieve as a, as a nation. But um, uh, thank you, Hugh. But, you know, at the same time, I think a lot of people are expecting when you're going to put a message out there uh, to, to bring that level of calm and, and, and quell anxieties and so on. One has to weigh the, the, the whole idea of bringing calm and accuracy and being fruitful and, and, and you know, be, let the people know the reality. You have to be realistic because things like these have a tendency of backfiring on you um, ever so often. So, uh, Dr. Stanley Paul, I want to thank you very much. Ms. Marcy Nadeu Sharma, attorney at law, I want to thank you. And Mr. Hugh Todd, and uh, you, the folks at home, we want to thank you very much for being part of this program. Of course, we're going to continue uh, to keep you informed as to what is happening in our country. We have just a few days, less than a week to go before the 21st of March. And, um, you know, clearly there is a crisis on the horizon. I think it's, it's, it's way past the horizon by now. It's by your back door almost. Um, so we're going to keep you informed as to what is happening. Until the next time, we want to say thank you very much for being part of the program. Guys, again, thank you for thank being you. here. Thank you.